<laughs> hey guys, and welcome back to Lost Bits, the series where we explore the unused, altered, and unseen content in gaming. It's been about a week since the release of Poppy Playtime's Chapter 2, and boy oh boy, I've gotten quite a few comments, even like a day after release, asking when I'll be making a Lost Bits video on it. Well, the answer is, right now. As we can learn to expect from these indie horror games nowadays, there's quite a lot that was changed in this game or was scrapped from the final release. Now for this first video, I'd like to focus on a prototype, beta, dev build, whatever you want to call it, version of the game that I've been dissecting for the last few days here that I haven't really seen many people talk about on YouTube yet. I will be making a second video covering more of the stuff that goes unused in this game and a lot of stuff found out of bounds, so stay tuned and make sure you're subscribed to be notified for that, but there are just so many cool features and changes in this prototype that I think there's enough here to warrant a standalone video. Anyways, with all that said, smack that like button with your blue hand grab pack, it's time to head on back to the Playtime Co. Factory and find some lost bits. Alright, first, a bit of backstory for this prototype dev build of this chapter. So at first, I didn't even know that this was an earlier build. As soon as I saw that Steam was pushing out updates for this chapter, I quickly copied the game's data to a separate drive to preserve the original. Then, when going to the game's files, naturally I clicked on DLC Chapter 2, thinking that was where I needed to go to play the second chapter. Makes sense, right? Well, soon after booting up, I noticed quite a few weird things like this checkpoint selection option, as well as a whole bunch of debug text on the screen when loading into the game. Now, at first, I thought I messed something up and unlocked some debug features, but later I learned that this was actually a fully functional prototype of the game that was packaged in with the release of this chapter. And, as of the making of this video, the current version of the game on Steam still has this in the files. So if you'd like to dinkle around with it yourself, all you need to do is click into your Steam folder, go into DLC Chapter 2, Windows No Editor, and then launch the executable there. Easy as that. Not sure if this was intended by the developers, I assume not, so I think this will be eventually removed in the future updates, so access it while you can. Anyways, back to the actual prototype, like I mentioned, right away on the title screen we can see the first major feature of this build. Essentially, you can input a number anywhere from 0 through 35 here, and then set it as your current checkpoint in the game. For example, 0 is the start of the game, 5 is the green hand production room, 35 is the end of the game, etc. This is honestly super nifty if you want to replay a section of the chapter, especially towards the end of it, without having to replay it over and over again. And the other thing I mentioned was the debug text that appears on screen. Now this shows off a bunch of information, like which hand is shot out, what stuff is loaded in, how you die, and a whole bunch of other stuff. It got quite annoying to always have this taking up space on screen, and frankly a lot of the messages weren't that valuable to me, so I ended up just disabling this. And oh yeah, I didn't mention it yet, but with this dev build you also have immediate access to the game's console commands, something that often you need third party software to unlock, so you can fiddle around with that here as well. And probably my favorite feature that this dev build offers is an unrestricted free camera so you can take the camera wherever you want in this chapter to see stuff hidden out of view. This feature, along with disabling the lighting, was absolutely a blessing for making this video possible. Now those debug features are fun and all, but there are so many changes seen in this chapter compared to the final release we got. Now I'm sure I won't catch every change, especially more minor ones like props being placed in different places, but I wanted to go front to back in this chapter and show off all the changes that I was able to note. So of course, spoilers ahead. Alright, so when starting off this chapter, the first thing I immediately noticed is that some subtitles appear when Poppy whispers to you. Now this is extra interesting since as of the making of this video, this chapter doesn't offer any sort of subtitles, and although the subtitles in this build are only seen like twice in the first two messages here, I guess the developers were at least working on it, so maybe we'll see subtitles implemented in a future update. The next change we see right away, and the one that first made me clue in that this build of the game is different than the final, is here with this door. The door to Elliot's office in this build is just a regular old white one, which I guess was just a placeholder before the fancier wooden one was implemented. 
The Huggy Wuggy cardboard cutout wasn't put in yet, the gold flower statue was originally found in the closet with the poppy key instead of on the desk in Elliot's room, which, speaking of which, just isn't there in this build, even though there's stuff floating over top of where it should be. Then another notable change in this room is that the vent up here where Poppy peeks out of wasn't added in this build yet either. Then onto the power puzzle room where you first find Poppy, in this build she isn't hiding out in a box before you meet her, instead she just kinda phases into existence. Then once back outside of the office here, another weird thing is seen with these hand scanners. Although the right hand is seen here in red, the loading bar appears green, which is kind of odd. Then after swinging into the next room, a small change I noticed in the dev build is that this vent here is open instead of closed as seen in the final. Now this is just a theory of mine, but I'd be willing to bet that Poppy was at least once planned to appear in this vent as she would move along with you into the room with the big hole. There's also two things here that I think support this. Firstly, in the final, the vent is open on the other side of the room here, and then this one is closed. So either she closed this vent behind her, or used the door to get into the next room and also closed it behind her, both of which I think are unlikely. And then secondly, every other block in this room can be moved around, except for this big red one by this vent, suggesting that this was an important set piece to this room. So my theory is that Poppy would have come out of this vent and then would climb up or would have had the player helping her up to this vent up here to get her into the next room. I think this would have been definitely more interesting than just running into her already in the room that follows. And speaking of this room, the prototype version doesn't have the signs on each hallway indicating where they would lead to in the facility. Then, after taking a slide down and doing the power puzzle here, the next major change I want to bring up is with many of the bits of dialogue in this build. For the most part, the voice lines are identical, it's just that this prototype uses raw voice lines without any effects. For example, here's a quick comparison of some of Mommy's lines between the builds. Oh, isn't it amazing? Mommy hasn't seen the place up and running in years. Oh, isn't it amazing? Mommy hasn't seen the place up and running in years. Now next, onwards we go to the main game station hub area. Now here outside of the area just looking a lot more empty, the biggest difference is actually with the train itself. As you can see, it's quite unfinished. The front is basically completely untextured, and even the rear units lack a few textures as well. Although you can still open the door with the green hand, there's no ramp or stairs to get in. There's actually a bit more to this train, but we'll save that for when we get to the ending of the chapter. The weirdest thing I find with this train is that there's actually a separate one that gets loaded above this room when you're walking around in other areas of the chapter. And this one, albeit still lacking some textures, is much more textured than the one that's seen normally here. It's really strange. Oh yeah, also in this room is a very large part of the code you need to get the train rolling. This first part is given to you after completing the musical memory game, so it's kind of odd that it's here as well. And on that note, let's now move on to the first sub-area here. Although a few of the cardboard cutouts are still seen in this chapter, the one here for Bunzo Bunny is here, but it lacks the button to hear the audio bits. I think this is the only instance that I saw of a cutout that's seen where it is in the final version, but it's a different model. Anyways, now we get to the green hand molding room, and things are pretty much the same here, but in this early version, you have to press this button here to get the green paint conveyor belt to start. This button is still there in the final release, but the green paint will automatically just go to you when you get up there. Now on to the memory match game. For starters, Bunzo Bunny appears to lack all animations when moving downward, and the lighting is almost non-existent. So much so that at first, just seeing the silhouette, I thought that this was some weird freaky alien thing with a tiny head. Then possibly the biggest difference in this room is the final button of this minigame. In the final version, this button is an exclamation mark in a triangle, but in this prototype build, it's a button that just has the word reset on it instead. Additionally, this button doesn't float in the middle and behind all of the other buttons, and instead just floats right through all the others on the bottom, making it look quite goofy. Next we got the rejected toys room, and here, in addition to the TV and VCR combo being moved from the top area to the bottom here in the prototype, the golden statue that's found on a bunch of stacked boxes is instead just found on top of these movable stairs. 
I can only assume this change was made to limit confusion since most players would probably think you could climb up these stairs to grab it. Next, moving on to the Wackawuggy section of the chapter, there's not too much to comment for this minigame itself, and the real only difference in bounds that I could find is once again with the VHS and TV combo. In the final, they are right beside each other and basically impossible to miss, almost forcing you to watch Jack Spadicey here. In this prototype though, the TV is found in this side of the room here, and the VHS tape is found in the next room, pretty much forcing you to redo the last section to put it in the VCR. And with that, now we're on to the final subsection here for the Statues minigame, where some more interesting changes can be seen. Being the final minigame, it shouldn't be too surprising that this section isn't nearly as polished as the others. For starters, PJ Pugapillar appears quite different in this prototype as he's covered in blood, much like many of the toys of him found around the facility. I guess the player wasn't meant to be the first victim in this area. Also at the start, PJ kinda just hangs there, as opposed to standing on a big boulder thing like he does in the final. Then moving along, only a sign for the leftmost easy pipe is placed in here, but it doesn't really matter which tunnel you take, as at the end of all of them, due to this object being misplaced, you get stuck no matter what. The end of this room is also much less intricate, as it just leads to a large empty corridor instead of the confusing pile of rubble that I initially thought you were supposed to climb on my first playthrough. Then next we move along to the water treatment facility where immediately we can see that there's some early placeholder text on these signs. Instead of the more stylized rotate top or bottom 90 degrees signs, these just simply say top 90 or bottom 90. The green VHS here, which lacks any labels in the prototype, seems to have been swapped with the note here instead, and it was moved to being in front of the game station door, which, oh yeah, is completely missing here as well. Then the middle section of this puzzle also appears much less finished lacking the middle column and blue thing holding the platforms together, and the handrails to all four sections are missing as well. Then in the toy puzzle room here, things are also in a much less than finished state. Right away, you'll notice that instead of Bunzo Bunny toys being moved around on the conveyor belts, we got basic models of a gift box. Furthermore, this area also lacks any sort of arrows indicating which way these levers move the elevator, as well as which way the conveyor belts are moving. It doesn't really make the puzzle that much more difficult or anything, it's just much less confusing with the arrows. Oh yeah, and there's also no traces of Huggy Wuggy being here, like the bits of fur or his blood that have led fans to theorize that this is where Huggy Wuggy falls after Chapter 1. Anyways, once after getting to the top and completing the puzzle here, you also don't just grab the box off the conveyor belt like you do with the doll in the final. Instead, you have to switch the conveyor so that the box will move onto the elevator, then you have to interact with the box to reveal that it was containing a Bunzo toy all along. Then after taking the toy and putting it into the scanner, which is almost impossible to see here, we can move on to this next puzzle room where the only real difference I could find was yet again with the VHS tape as it's found on this table here, instead of being in the box with the green hand power source. After completing this, we then get to the start of the end with the jump scare for Mommy here where this door appears to be a placeholder version as we can see it awkwardly open with some default textures inside. Then, Mommy doesn't really chase you here. As long as you're out of sight by the time she counts down to zero, you can actually go back up and she'll just be gone. The next major difference can be seen in this room here. In the final release, you pull this red switch to activate the conveyor belt to move into this emergency exit room. In this prototype build though, this switch is actually walled off with a one-way chunk of sheet metal, and instead there's an exit sign suggesting that this was the original intended path here. And this path here is actually the same one that you go on towards the end of this chapter, so I guess in this build you basically would go through it twice, so I guess it's a good thing that this was changed. Other changes down here include this sealed door swinging open instead of moving upwards, there's a random model of mommy sticking out in the wall here that looks way too happy when we look out of bounds, and then we get to the furnace room which was certainly unfinished in this build. Here, the puzzle is rather similar, but the assets are all different. Instead of bringing up a yellow gear mold to this furnace mold to then get another gear to insert into this motor, here you would grab this unfinished gear mold, slap it into the furnace, which here has another version of it floating beside it, 
to then get this gear to fit into this open gear train. Furthermore, there are some bits of floating text outside of this room that reference a second key and another mold. There's actually this mold found far off out of bounds in the distance that appears to be a mold of a triangular key similar to the one that's seen in episode 1, so perhaps there was also a second step to this puzzle that was planned here as well. Anyways, yeah, this puzzle appears visually a lot more basic in this build, like hell, this gear train doesn't even move at all, but the idea is still pretty much the same. Then, after opening this door and running back to avoid mommy, you will notice that the inside of this furnace doesn't have handles to pull it closed, so instead of having to close the door to hide like in the final, here you can just go inside, and I guess mommy just doesn't see you. In fact, instead of closing the doors, you can only push them open even more here to hide even less. Makes sense. The rest of the chase sequence with Mommy is basically the same, only with the hands and stuff not quite in the right spots, and honestly, Mommy just seemed to move a lot faster here, making this section quite difficult. And now onto the climax here, after opening this last door to escape Mommy, we're greeted to quite the early version of her death animation. Yeah, unfortunately she doesn't get ground up, but instead is just like pulled into the machine and then her model just remains all stretched out on the floor. Also, there is absolutely zero presence of the creepy prototype claw thing here. There is a long hallway behind this door, but yeah, just no prototype fella. A few other changes from this point include the doors around the control room here just like floating when open, the number sequence for the last bit of the train code always appears to be 1423 instead of being sort of randomized like it is in the final, there are some spots where you can actually fall back down to the middle which would be an absolute disaster to have to backtrack after, and finally the way back down to the hub area is just some boring old stairs here instead of the slide that's used in the final version. Now back to the train, we can see the untextured inside, as well that there are two brake levers, two handles to start the train, and the whole console appears much different than the one seen in the final. The functions are the same, but yeah, it just looks so different. Now honestly, at first I didn't think this train would be functional at all, but not only does the code work, you actually don't even need it to start the train, as just pulling the handle here will get the train rolling, regardless of what code is entered. So I guess that wasn't really programmed in here yet. Although the train whistle handle unfortunately doesn't work here yet either, to finish things off, the ending here is actually quite different. Poppy's dialogue is almost entirely different in this prototype build compared to the final. Here's a comparison of what Poppy says in both of the ending clips. I was so scared she'd put me back in that case. But you saved me. You are perfect. Too perfect to lose. I'm sorry. I can't let you leave. I've never met anyone like you. <laughs> Do you know how long I've been stuck in that case? Well... Too long. I had so much time to think and reflect. Time to figure out exactly what I would do when free. We'll set things right. Terrible things have happened. But I know that whatever I need you to do, you are capable. We will. What if... You did it. Against all odds. You defeated Mommy, and you freed me once again. You are perfect. Too perfect to lose. I'm sorry. I cannot let you leave yet. You have so much potential. I know you came to find the ones who had disappeared all those years ago. But they're gone. They've been gone for a long time. Terrible things have happened. And I am the cause. 
being able to exist as a doll, it has killed so many people. So much is unknown to you. Where do I even begin? But you can fix everything. I see it inside you. This train is now heading towards Playcare. It's the best place to start looking. I w- <gasps> What? What is- So although she still bamboozles you, in this prototype build, she seems much less antagonistic than in the final, where I guess her betrayal was really made to seem more negative. And honestly, yeah, I feel like it gives a completely different feel to the ending. After this, the train will also start to go fast, but in the prototype, you actually don't have to hit the brakes, as you'll just keep going forever and ever, and after a while, the background audio will just cut out too. But if you do pull the brakes as intended, you're greeted to a very much unfinished animation of the train crashing, and then you just die, and get sent back to the last checkpoint, being at this emergency exit door before Mommy's grind. So yeah, I guess there's no ending cutscene teaser for the next chapter that was implemented in this build yet, either. There are actually so many differences between this prototype and the final, that I'm sure there are handfuls of details that I missed. It's not often that we do get to see prototypes of games like this, especially not right on release day, so it's incredible that this was found just kicking around in the retail release of the game. And we're certainly not done exploring this game yet either, as there's an absolute boatload of unused content to cover from both chapters, as well as numerous out-of-bound stuff that I want to go over, so again, make sure you're subscribed to be notified as soon as the next videos go live. And while you're here, check out my video on the first chapter if you haven't already, and as always, thank you all so much for tuning in today, and I will see you in a bit.